Surrealism was founded almost 100 years ago in 1924 with the publication of the first Surrealist Manifesto. There was a definition of Surrealism, pure psychic automatism, by which it is intended to express either verbally or in writing or in any other way the functioning of thought. The Surrealist objects are extremely various and they take many different forms. And so the object, anything, could be anything at all, would be something that linked you to the real world. The telephone was one of Dali's favorite motifs. And he was very aware of the political connotations of that with the famous telephone calls between Hitler and the Western powers. And one of his paintings, called The Enigma of Hitler, has a telephone with a little bit bitten out of the receiver part of it. Dali's very famous lobster telephone seems to have originated in an idea that he had about the analogies between the receiver and a lobster shell, the relationship between the hard and the soft. And he was very fascinated by the crustaceans, who of course are creatures that have armor on the outside and their flesh inside. And he would compare that with the human being, who unfortunately has its flesh on the outside and any kind of bone armor is on the inside. So he was, he was interested in this, in this relationship. And it could be that cannibalism of the telephone was linked to the lobster telephone. The surrealist object could be seen as being quite contradictory because on the one hand, it was a very important aspect of the surrealist desire to actually find forms of expression and forms of, sort of representation, if you like, that were not conventional artistic ones, that were not sort of conforming to aesthetic ideas. The object here, why not sneeze, Rose c'est la vie, consists of a bought birdcage, which Dujon has adjusted and turned the the pieces inwards, and he's added what looked like cubes of sugar to it. And this was because he was playing with a visual pun. The cubes looked like sugar, but when he invited friends to pick it up, they found that it was actually too heavy to lift, because in fact, not sugar at all, it's marble that he had cut up and placed inside the birdcage. What he was interested in was actually operating with objects from the everyday world and taking them out of their context so that they are, what are they? He was asking the question, what are these things if they no longer have the function that we associate with them? One of the most extraordinary objects is by the artist Artur Cruzeiro Seixas, who was a Portuguese artist. Its title is No Longer Looking at the Earth, but keeping feet firmly on the ground. But this object is a really interesting example of the paradox, if you like, of the surrealist object, which is that it is material, it is there, it's very often a very simple thing that is either utilitarian or is in some way part of the earthly aspect of our existence, like, like a bull in this case, and its hoof. And linking that to something completely different, so it, it actually invites you to step beyond the familiar, to step beyond the, the limitations of the things that surround us. Eileen Agar was one of the artists working in the UK at the time of the, the Surrealist Exhibition in London, 1936, and she was invited to participate in the exhibition. And as she said, she felt surprised to find herself a Surrealist overnight, but she embraced it and she loved it, and she had a terrific imagination. One of her most famous pieces, which is related to the hats that she used to construct, and which she was filmed wearing in the street in a film that was actually broadcast at the time of the 1936 exhibition. The Angel of Anarchy, which is a plaster head that she has wrapped in layers and layers of different silk kimonos and bits of feather and bits of beadwork, references to all kinds of different societies. But of course, wrapping these things around a face blinds it, disrupting the rational world and disrupting the order that we're familiar with. Cornell's boxes are 
among I mean, the most original, the most extraordinary creations that are associated with surrealism. The particular example that, that is here is dedicated to Judith Pasta, who was a very famous opera singer from the 19th century. And Cornell was really obsessed with, with the sort of romantic era of dance and opera and ballet. And his, his objects are constructed from materials that he found. The found object for Cornell was often the prompt for his imagination. He was, he was sort of beachcomber, and he would put them together in boxes that are the most extraordinary concentrations of, of ideas and of feelings. And it's, it's as if you're seeing planets. It's like things revolving around the Earth. So it has an extraordinary combination of the, the miniature and the vast. The objects that they chose, utilitarian objects, had to be sort of deviated from their function. So you have this, this very interesting interplay between the object that links you to the world, but is actually taken out of its context. It's an interesting way of looking at what the Surrealists conceived as reality, if you like, as the real. Because it's not just, as it were, countering the real, it's not just disrupting the real, but it's actually really expanding the idea of reality and expanding the idea of what we conceive as the real. But I think in Surrealism, it has an additional concentration and focus and a sense of actually reintroducing poetry into the everyday.